Well, welcome everyone. My name is Leslie Thompson. I'm director of adult programs here at the Sid Richardson Museum. And I'm delighted to see so many beautiful faces with us tonight. So thank you for joining us. Um, before I introduce our guest speaker tonight, I first want to acknowledge and pay respect to all Native American peoples who have lived here since time immemorial. And I'd especially like to acknowledge and pay respect to the Wichita and affiliated tribes, which include the Waco, Kachai, Tawakoni, and Tauvea, upon whose historical homeland we are conducting tonight's lecture program. And while I recognize that a simple statement is insufficient to support the rights and well-beings of Indigenous peoples, I like to say a land acknowledgement as a reminder to continue to educate myself and others on the um, past and present histories of Native communities, both in North Texas and beyond, um, like those represented in our collection. And our collection has deep holdings in the artworks of Charles Russell, um, who is the center of our new exhibition that you've seen out on display in our galleries called Charles M. Russell, Storyteller Across Media. And the exhibit focuses on the artist's talent and ability to tell stories through art. Um, and so Russell depicts a variety of narratives from the American West, including uh, Plains Indians, Anglo Cowboys, um, Hispanic Vaqueros, hunters, prospectors, and so on. Um, but one story that is missing is that of Black Americans on the Great Plains. Um, so this presentation tonight will explore the westward migration of thousands of African Americans um, during the American Reconstruction and through World War II. And special attention will be focused on the role of the federal government via the Homestead Act. Um, and how the establishment of new African American communities created a cultural shift within then popular understandings of the West um, that still resonate today. Now, our speaker tonight is Dr. Kalinda Eaton, and she is associate professor in the Clara Looper Department of African American or of African and African American Studies at the University of Oklahoma. And she is director of Oklahoma Research for the Black Homesteader Project, which is funded by the National Park Service in partnership with the Center for Great Plains Studies. Dr. Eaton is a humanities scholar focused on African-American Western studies, intersections of Black literary studies and feminist criticism, as well as African-American social and cultural history and Black diaspora studies. She received her MA and PhD from The Ohio State University and BA from Dillard University. She is the author of Womanism, Literature, and the Transformation of the Black Community, 1965 to 1980, and additional scholarship on representations of African Americans in American Western history, literature, and popular culture. She is known for her teaching and for her public scholarship on what African American regional experiences can tell us about American cultural and national politics. Recent publications include Black Women Writers Reclaiming Western Literature, the co-edited New Directions in Black Western Studies, and Teaching the Black West. And we are delighted to have her with us tonight. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Kalinda Eaton. To you. Just put it on here. Yeah. Can you hold it? Or okay. Leave it on. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for such a wonderful introduction. I feel like I have to live up to all of this now. Um, so uh, thank you so much, uh, Leslie, for the invitation to come to the CID. Uh, we met not too long ago, right, um, at the Russell Center uh, in Oklahoma. And so it was a lovely meeting at that time. And when I saw your invitation, I was very excited to be able to come and talk to the community that you spoke so highly of and all of you uh, who attend these events. Um, so what I'm going to do today is talk a bit about the images that you're going to see on the screen, um, but I'm going to, to do it maybe in a, a more unconventional way. Uh, so they are supposed to rotate. We will see if that happens, but they're supposed to rotate. Um, and, and so they'll be behind me as I am talking about kind of this, oh, we're doing well, uh, talking about the history and kind of contextualizing some of these images. And then after I finish uh, what 
I have in terms of my prepared remarks, I'll go back to these images and kind of talk through them. Okay, sound fair? All right. Um, so you might have seen uh, the very first video. I know you, or or you might have been paying attention to the, to the introduction, um, but uh, that was actually a clip from uh, Will a uh, Will Will Rogers uh, film called The Rope and Fool. Um, and so there were all these um, different examples of of roping. However, before we get started, I do not have my glasses on. So we are not going to be doing too much of anything um, until I'm able to see. <laughs> so let's start there. Is this, oh, I, don't hear, what, I don't hear any, but I don't, oh, that's fine. Okay, okay, I wanted to make sure. I mean, I know you all can hear me, but I wasn't sure about the, uh, the media. Okay. Agnes Walker, Bartlesville, Oklahoma born in 1862, excerpt from interview on January 13th, 1938. My parents were former slaves. Clem Rogers, father of the famous Will Rogers was my father's master and was a good friend of the family. Dan Walker was brought from Fort Gibson to work as a cowboy on the Clem Rogers ranch. I had been reared near the ranch and soon met Dan and married him. He was the best roper and rider on the ranch and Will Rogers, or better known to his friends as Willie, than a child of seven or eight years old, was always happy when he was with Dan. My husband taught him to rope and ride when he was about 10 years old. Mr. Rogers bought Will a pony, which he named Comanche. Will and Comanche became great friends. And after Will was older, he used Comanche for trick riding in the show. When he, as a child, spent many hours riding over the prairie on his Comanche, he was roping everything in sight. I had three children near Will's age and he led a happy, carefree life with them and my uncle Rab's boys. He learned to rope and ride with my children, Charlotte, Charlie, and Mac, as their father patiently taught them many tricks with the rope. In their play, they practiced roping and soon Charlotte could rope and ride as well as the boys. When Will was 10 years old, his mother died. This was a great blow to the youth as well as to the entire community for Mary Rogers was loved by all who knew her. She had a generous loving disposition. After her death, Will spent much of his time at our home and we became Aunt Babe and Uncle Dan to him. So what does it mean to picture the American West? What do we see? What do we imagine was there centuries before our existence? For years, very few people questioned the face of the American West in art, literature, and film. The prevailing images were based on Manifest Destiny, which called for Easterners to bring democracy and capitalism to all of North America. For the West was wild, untamed, and ripe for the taking. The belief was also that the people native to the place were wild, untamed, and ripe for the taking, as was the land they protected. Popular artistic renderings include exoticized Native women on bright, bold canvases, resolute elders with horses and teepees nearby, or cowboys. Rugged, strong, ruddy, white. This has been the picture of the American West that has been consistent and accepted even to this day. I grew up in what is called the Far West. I'm a second generation Californian. And my maternal family is from nearby, actually, here in East Texas and also Oklahoma. Yet these questions about Western identity, images, perception, they were never asked in my community. 
In fact, I would watch Western films on television in a very detached manner, as if I was looking at a staged invention from an imaginary land, something that was not only not real, but not even based on reality. I guess in some ways I was correct, but the strange thing is that the imagined West was very real for generations of people and remains the way that we picture this place. So the title of the discussion is West Side Stories, Interpreting African-American Migration and Settlement in the Western United States. I began with the excerpt from Agnes Walker's interview because another way the Old West is imagined and imaged is through erasure. By this, I mean the region is supported by those we do not see. I include the images that you'll see on the screen because we are proud of Will Rogers. He, he epitomized all that was Oklahoma as a mixed race Cherokee man. He was a descendant of those who participated in treaties, those who were considered privileged until the Civil War, but then very industrious and successful afterwards. The American exceptionalism, the American individualism, pulling oneself up by one's bootstraps. Will Rogers is known for his roping skills and charisma, but we do not question how these skills were learned. The general public does not learn about Dan. We only see the entertainer's self-effacing smile. People considered Black in the terms of ra American racial categories have lived and traveled through the American West since at least the 15th century, first with Spanish conquistadores, then with others that called themselves explorers or fur traders. Uh, these men were often translators, guides, and cultural brokers. We can consider them transient, like the Europeans in their party, always moving through this space, but never settling. But of course, the West as we know it did not exist. It was the Kiowa, the Comanche, Apache, Bannock, Blackfeet, Osage, Pawnee. Then it was Spain or France or Mexico, but not America and not the West. As time progressed, there was more permanent Black settlement in the territories. And by the 1840s, nearly 9,000 people of African descent were living in Indian territory, which we now know of as Oklahoma, for example. They primarily came from the southeastern United States, were mostly enslaved, uprooted with their native masters and sometimes kin, and relocated to assigned lands as part of the federally designed Indian removal plan, also known as the Trail of Tears. In those early years, some tribes like the Chickasaw, for example, had counts of at least two times the amount of African descended people than those who actually qualified as quote unquote full blood members of the tribe. Until recently, the individual lives and experiences of the laborers were not a part of general knowledge and there is still so much to be unearthed. Toward the end of Reconstruction, or what, we're call, what we call Reconstruction in America, there were fewer and fewer choices for African Americans, particularly in the Southern states. The contested presidential election in 1876 between Rutherford B. Hayes and Samuel Tilden left African Americans more politically disenfranchised than they were a few years earlier. There was also the federal withdrawal of troops in 1877 um, and just kind of sheer lawlessness, right, um, and state rule. The implementation of severe Jim Crow laws and Black codes, domestic terrorism, and the Supreme Court ruling in the Plessy versus Ferguson case, which upheld segregation in 1896, made it very clear that African Americans, though making progress, continue to be in jeopardy in a lot in a lot of this country. But prior to this time, there was also quite a bit of discussion about relocation out of the southern states. Leaders within this kind of general, you know, national black community debated where the best place would be to have an opportunity at true liberation. There were discussions about other places in the Western Hemisphere 
Haiti, Central America, Canada, and the more controversial possibility of colonizing parts of Western Africa. There are several theories for why African-American migration west uh, into the Northern and Southern Plains was so popular in the years following reconstruction. Scholars and historians point to failed crops caused by droughts in the South, the re-enslavement of workers within the sharecropping scheme, high, uh, which produced, I'm sorry, um, low pay and high debt. Others identify the Homestead Act of 1862 and a subsequent nationwide emphasis on expansion or charting quote unquote new territories, uh, albeit at the expense of those who were already there as the starting point or spark that pointed people west. The idea to move west was not a new concept, but as scholars like Quintar Taylor note in his research, it was not always the obvious choice for people who uh, always looked north. So Congress passes the Homestead Act of 1862, and it was formally titled an act to secure homesteads to actual settlers on the public domain. That was its official title. Its focus was a system to create family farms. Under the act, the federal government offered eligible settlers 160 acres of public land for free after they had completed several requirements and paid a deposit, so it wasn't free. <laughs> they had to pay a filing fee, usually under $20, to process the initial claim. They had to live on their claims for five years, and it was later reduced to, to three years. They had to build a residence, usually at least um, you know, by these kind of particular uh, measurements and make improvements on the land. In other settings, I've spoken about how this question of eligibility becomes important for African Americans because initially it excludes as it includes. For example, eligibility for homesteads extended to male citizens over 21, war veterans of any age, widows and single women, and married women who were listed as the heads of households. So this opened up land possibilities, land ownership possibilities to a vast number of American citizens who were typically poor and working class and unable to secure land through other means. Another intriguing part of the act allowed new immigrants into the US to participate in the program if they stated an intent to become a citizen. However, if you look at the eligibility criteria again, in 1860, for example, two years before we have the kind of signed Homestead Act, uh, about 4.1 million people of African descent uh, were um, living in the United States and only about 488,000 were free, so about 9%. And since the 15th Amendment was not adopted until 1868, uh, these individuals were not legally considered citizens. So, I mean, we do have in 1866, the civil rights legislation that stated that African Americans could homestead. Um, and thousands of people did take advantage of the opportunity coming from North and Midwest and South, right, into uh, the, the Plain States. But even then, there were questions about where exactly they could go and where they could thrive. So the homesteader had to, to prove up his or her claim, which required public notices, witnesses, affidavits, lots of paperwork and evidence that the habitation and claims were legitimate. And as someone who is leading a team of people going, combing through all of these documents and for all these individuals, uh, the paperwork per individual, per family is immense. After passing this step, the claimant received a title from the general land office. Um, and there's also these other options in terms of um, residing on the land for six months to 14 months and commuting one's claim, which is kind of purchasing the land outright. But those options were not always available to, to those with little means. Um, often we saw railroad companies um, and other kind of larger uh, businesses, so to speak, um, kind of taking that particular route. 
So while the post-Reconstruction West did not have the lure of factory work and industry as seen later during the post-World War II, kind of great migration, or post-World War I, I'm sorry, great migration north, increased propaganda promised a comfortable life. You had town boosters who were convincing African-Americans of the paradise, and those are the words that they would use, paradise, just beyond the border. They called Kansas, New Canaan. Um, and communities were founded based on the possibility of railroad tracks being laid nearby. According to published records, and you had seen some of those maps on the screen, uh, between 1880 and 1900, the states of Kansas, Nebraska, Texas, and Oklahoma witnessed an increase of African Americans between 50 and 150 percent. Depending on the state, farming, cattle, ranching, and entrepreneurship promised a better environment and wage than the options in the South. So for Black migrants or immigrants with an E, uh, the mythic West was presented as uh, this space that was replete with fertile ground, burgeoning crops, and vast open spaces untouched and unburdened by man or his exclusionary laws. With African-American homesteaders, it's important to note that the intentional forethought was there and it was designed to preserve communalism and ensure progress, not only within uh, the but Black community at large, but also the space in which the families lived. In other words, there's this awareness, there was this awareness of the relationship between the vastness of the land around the individuals, the pride of ownership, and the inherent rights that they would have as American citizens. Regarding this last perspective, uh, in the book of the same title, Virgin Land, here, Henry Nash Smith notes that in the wake of the Kansas-Nebraska Nebraska Act, um, the op opposition to slavery was a subsidiary part of the case for the Homestead Bill as it was presented to Western voters. He continues to say that the strongest appeal of the homestead system to the West, an appeal which touched the deepest levels of American experience in the 19th century, lay in the belief that it would enact by statute the fee simple empire, the agrarian utopia of hardy and virtuous yeomen, which had haunted the imaginations of writers about the West since the time of Crevacour. The outlaw culture of the Wild West gave way to virtual strangers with common histories quickly becoming part of a collective, bound to protect each other from external or internal danger, but only if necessary. The power of the newly formed communities was demonstrated through demands for citizenship and equal protection under the law, which quickly became goals for all residents. Yet there is also little engagement with questions of land sovereignty, indigenous land claims. Those moving into the territories were remaking themselves using a model that America provided. I'm gonna figure out where I wanna go next. On the path to citizenship, members of the new communities initially believed they were able to defend themselves from mob rule and injustice by taking advantage of the legal system, something they were unable to do in the South. There is ample documentation of attempts to solve challenges in front of a judge rather than resort to kind of this Wild West gun violence. Unfortunately, many found little difference in their status west of the Mississippi and were forced to protect their freedom at any cost. There were challenges. National newspapers often reported the perils that many Black migrants faced as they tried to claim land, including violent confrontations and those who forced them off of their land. One popular image that you saw that I'll return back to um, says all colored people that want to go to Kansas on September 5th, 1877 can do so for $5. The very last paragraph though reads, that this colony shall have from one to 200 militia, more or less, as the case may require, to keep peace and order. And any member failing to pay in his dues 
as aforesaid or failing to comply with the above rules in any particular will not be recognized or protected by the colony. Think about that. Hmm? Oh, I thought you were saying something. I am particularly interested in the phrasing in that last sentence where it says will not be recognized or protected by the colony. This is in Kansas, right? So this statement acknowledges the direct economic connection between communal laws and defense. In other words, no payment, no compliance, no protection. This shows that community was to be upheld at any cost and also signals that there were threats from outside the space. So in my work, I research how the Great Plains as space were ideals of democracy and freedom for African Americans were imagined, attempted, but not always fully realized. I examine fictional writings, archival documents, and images. I consider how a fuller picture of the West enhances historical research and provides expanded discussions of race, identity, and displacement on the Western frontier. The Great Plains then becomes more than just a sub-region of the West, but exists as a gray area between slavery and freedom with its borders on either side, symbolizing a continuously precarious nature of what it means to exist in North America. These are very nuanced questions that require us all to consider what we miss when stories remain untold. What we have here now on the screen is actually um, a piece of a, 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 a newspaper article um, talking about Wellston, o um, Oklahoma Territory in Lincoln County. And it's cautioning those in the community, in the county, um, that there's been a kind of a large influx of African Americans from other parts of the United States moving into the space to homestead, to settle, to build communities. Um, and so that was um, kind of a, a caution piece there. What you have here are some of the maps that I, uh, I'm sorry, some of the data that I mentioned earlier in terms of kind of where people are coming from and also how many people are moving into these spaces at any given time. Um, as you see over on, I guess, the my, my left, um, well, your left, I guess, um, you have between 1850 and 1890, those large populations that I was talking about, but it also identifies by state uh, on the west side of the Missouri River, um, what those populations are um, and kind of what, what we see by the time we get to 1890. So that's the, the tall blue line. Oh, sure. When they applied for this land, was there a specific area that they were given? So the land overall, through all of the different Plains states uh, that was made available, quote unquote, um, was um, already, already um, allotted, if I could use that term, um, because of the, the various different treaties that were broken um, and renegotiated uh, with Native tribes. So the land was tribal land, right? Um, then the federal government comes in, um, and each state is very different in terms of kind of what happened and why. Like, for example, in Oklahoma, um, there was um, this kind of renegotiation of, of many of the land treaties because of members of the five tribes participated in the Confederacy, and so that was their punishment, right? Right. Um, so, I mean, but you have different territories in different states that have different um, stories. Um, but anyway, and so the land then was designated based on kind of the how much land they had taken away from particular tribal nations and then kind of reallocated that land to the tribal nations. And then whatever was left was seen as government land. And that was then what was assigned to people or pe that people could actually take advantage of. So is there any difference between what was allocated in uh, to the white population versus the African American population? No, not at all. Actually, um, not on paper, not from the federal government. Let me put it that way. 
Okay. Uh, the federal government did not have any provisions, whether you were a woman, whether you were, you know, widowed, you know, African American, whether you're immigrant from Germany, what have you, right? Um, there was not any um, restriction in terms of where you could be. However, on the ground, uh, the social community started to make those different distinctions, right? Um, so you had, um, uh, say, let's just say some um, homesteaders or people who are interested in being homesteaders um, who might have been white coming from Louisiana. I'm just picking a state um, from Louisiana and they, you know, have settled in a particular area. And then you have other people coming in who they don't think that they want to live near them, right? Um, they would actively prevent them from homesteading or, um, you know, kind of, you know, terrorize them until they left, you know, or moved elsewhere. So that was happening within the social network. That was not something that came from the, from the federal government. It's a great question. What we have here is, um, oh, I included some, a lot of pictures from uh, Black towns in Oklahoma, because I find it striking that um, when we think about uh, uh, Russell, for example, right? Um, and when Russell was painting um, and what Russell was painting, <laughs> um, all of these years overlap, okay? Um, so I mean, everything that I was talking about, uh, we're, we're, we're really uh, starting somewhere around, you know, 1830-ish, right? And ending, well, I ended somewhere maybe like around 1930, Okay, so about a hundred year period. And so then you have, you know, all of these images and that goes back to the first part of, of what I was uh, saying here, uh, that you have all of these images of the West, but it's kind of this making of the West, right? If we think about how the West, as I said before, wasn't the West as we know it until much later in the 19th century. And it was through image making, it was through painting, it was through, you know, even photography as we, you know, you get, get a little bit further down um, and on the timeline. And so then this West becomes something that is imagined by those who are behind the camera or, you know, holding the paintbrush, right? Uh, or illustrating in various different ways. But all of this is happening at the same time in the West but you don't often see any of these people or these communities or these experiences represented in that work. Now, of course, we could say, well, that wasn't the goal, right? That they weren't interested in, in representing that, which, you know, it's fine. Everyone is entitled to whatever they would like to represent. Um, but I always find it curious um, that even when we think about cowboy culture, right? Of course, Cowboy culture is huge everywhere, um, worldwide. Um, and the images of cowboys, you will have vaqueros, right? You will, as was mentioned, um, you will have a lot of the uh, Native American cowboys, even alongside um, kind of these traditional images of uh, white cowboys, but then often the African American cowboys who were working alongside uh, the uh, indigenous and also um, uh, Mexican and Mexican American cowboys only, like they were all together, are then removed. They're, they're not there, right? I won't say removed, I'll just say they're not included, right? Um, and so then there's this kind of erasure that takes place within this kind of image of the West that I, I find to be interesting. Um, this right here is Canada, so the Western Plains. Um, so we have a movement about 19, 1909 through about 1911 uh, of a large movement actually of African-Americans from Oklahoma who then uh, move, migrate right up to uh, Canada because Canada starts to open up the Western side, Western Plains, um, again, indigenous land, okay, First Nations people. And they're, you know, trying to, they meaning the uh, federal government of Canada are trying to um, populate, right, these areas that they say are, you know, not inhabited, quote unquote. Um, but anyway, and so they open up land and it's like, come one, come all, okay? Um, and so you have these families that come from Oklahoma, this is another one, um, into Alberta, Canada. And they were used to homesteading because they've been homesteading right on the plains, on the on the American plains, I should say. So they go up and homestead on the North American plains. Um, they built had these, you know, uh, fabulous communities out there in uh, Amber Valley. And there are all these different these uh, different towns and, and communities there in Alberta. Um, and then when the federal government in Canada starts to realize that um, these large populations of African-Americans, some from the South, but mostly from the Plain States are crossing the border. 
uh, and taking advantage of the open, quote unquote, open land, um, they shut the program down. <laughs> and say, well, wait a minute, this is not exactly what we wanted. We wanted different immigrants, right? Um, and so this is one of the baseball teams in Edmonton, um, kind of like our equivalent of the, the Negro Leagues, right, in the, in North, in, uh, in the U.S. Um, but anyway, so then they shut the program down, um, and then they have, you know, all of these uh, documents that, that I some of, one of the documents is up here on this uh, up here on, in the slides, but that they you know have written um, saying you know oh you know this climate is not conducive you know uh, to these people meaning weather right it's too cold there are these editorials and cartoons saying oh you know you'll freeze here go back home um, and then uh, what I think what I find to be particularly interesting is the and once that argument didn't really work right the other argument which was well if you come here if more if more of you I should say come here then you will bring American racism with you and we don't basically need those problems here so think about that, right? <laughs> so the people are bringing racism with them, right? Um, the somehow and, and crossing the 49th parallel. Um, and so, yes. Um, well, one second, one second. I just want to say really quickly before this this jumps off. Um, so this is one of the uh, this is a document here. His excellence, his excellency in council, in virtue of the provisions da 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 da, uh, for a period of one year from and after the date hereof, the landing in Canada shall be and the same is prohibited of any immigrants belonging to the Negro race, which race is deemed unsuitable to the climate and requirements of Canada. Okay, sorry. Yes. Oh, okay, <laughs> okay. I didn't real. I didn't know if it had already showed uh, before. Um, and so, but anyway, one of the other images, and I think I don't have the the clickers up here. Okay, thank you. Um, one of the other. Well, I'll wait till it finishes. But one of the other images that I can come back to is actually uh, from a newspaper. Uh, and from a rural town in, in Oklahoma, and it has these huge ads, right, that the Canadian government was placing in, you know, in these newspapers all across the plains saying, you know, come on up, right, because you're just crossing the border. I mean, it's the same climate, right, same, same type of agricultural um, uh, um, landscape, right, and they were just like, come on up. And I'm not quite sure who they thought was going to be reading these papers or what, but they were surprised. Did they have to leave? Those who were already there did not, no. Um, and, but those who were on the way were, some were stopped at the border. I included this picture here um, because it's Texas <laughs> in Maya. Uh, but this, um, I, I did some research down there uh, several years ago before the, the library burned down. It's so sad. But anyway, I, I got a lot of images there, uh, images from the library. And um, even though we don't often think about maybe that far south as being the, you know, the plains, it still is kind of geographically a part of, of the Texas plains. And um, I was also interested in kind of the, the ways in which in the 1920s, particularly 1920s and 30s, um, you know, the oil boom in Texas also provided these various different opportunities for people, right? Um, so it wasn't just homesteading, it wasn't just farming. And again, I'm looking at these dates, right? Um, and so you've seen a lot of people with, am I able to move forward now? Or am I pointing it this way? No, no, I don't want to, okay. Do, am I pointing it this way? Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, so, um, we can go back to here. Uh, so you see a lot of people with, um, you know, suits on, right? I mean, of course, everyone wore a suit in, <laughs> in the 19 teens and 1920s. Uh, but you see a lot of this kind of imaging, like self-imaging of, you know, kind of who who we are, quote unquote, and who we who we want to be, right? And how we are presenting ourselves. And these are all, you know, this is all in this Western space. And so while people were not um, uh, kind of, well, I'll say while they were less likely to maybe sit for a portrait, right, in terms of a painting, um, they definitely were sitting for these um, family and individual portraits in terms of photography. And so in Nebraska, for example, there is a, a fabulous arch archive of, you know, Black Nebraskans, like 19 teens, 1920s, during um, what we would think of as kind of like the Harlem Renaissance or the, or the, um, the um, oh, roaring 20s, right? Um, and kind of how that uh, 
culture and the the, um, the images and kind of the excitement right of that time actually was playing out um, in these communities in the West. Okay, this right here, and I know I'm running out of time, but I'll just kind of go through these really quickly, um, is the copy of um, the first page of the um, the interview that I read, of the excerpt that I read in the very beginning um, with uh, Mrs. Agnes Walker, uh, whose father was uh, enslaved by uh, Will Rogers father. Um, and so this was a part of the Works Progress Administration, um, federal, uh, the WPA narratives, um, where they were interviewing in the 1930s, interviewing um, uh, formerly enslaved people, Native Americans, uh, uh, Okies, everybody was being interviewed, right, during this time. Um, and so we have uh, this, uh, you know, kind of rich um, archive of these personal statements and narratives where people are talking about what life was like in the 19th century um, as a part of the um, the New Deal. I included all of these images because of the roping, right? Um, and so when you see the roping, when you think about the West, you think about where Rogers in the West, he always has this rope, right? Um, I don't know how many, I mean, how many of you actually have paid any attention in your lifetime to Will Rogers, but if you had, um, he always had this rope and that was his thing, right? I mean, he became famous um, actually on vaudeville and what have you as kind of like the country, the kind of country boy who could, you know, rope a steer and do all these tricks and what have you. And so um, I just thought it was, you know, important to think about how the rope brings him to a worldwide prominence, right? Um, this, this roping and this, this ability to do these tricks and this ability to, to, of course, participate in this form of entertainment comes from Dan, right? Um, on his uh, father's plantation um, in Oklahoma. So I think that's interesting. And also this Google Doodle, um, they were celebrating Will Rogers' birthday and they had, it's like an animated doodle where he's, he's uh, roping there. We know, I mean, we, I think we know this is the, the image of the. Did uh, Will Rogers in any of his interviews or writings reference? You know, I, I was thinking about that. That's a very good question. I have been looking, but I haven't found any yet. So I can't say no. Um, but from what I've seen, um, he talks about, you know, his ability and other people are talking about his ability. Um, but I, for example, I haven't read the biography or something like a, if he has a biography or what have you. Um, but I was thinking about that. So what the, the what I've read, I don't, I have not seen it. Um, but I don't think, I mean, I honestly don't think that, well, I can't say what I think about a person I don't know, <laughs> but, but based on, um, based on kind of the, the narrative from uh, Miss Agnes and also uh, from kind of the ways in which he was, has been portrayed in at least Oklahoma history as being very conscientious. Um, I, I would maybe be surprised if he would have never mentioned it, right? I'm sure you're all very familiar with this image of Columbia uh, holding the telephone wire, going to, you know, civilize the West. What would you say? Yeah. Oh, I thought, you, oh, okay. <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly. Um, and again, you know, um, all sorts of issues and problems <laughs> with the with the image, um, but it it epitomizes that time, right? Leaving the east behind, going to this west, and you see the darkness over on the the left hand side, right? The bison are going into this like dark area because there's nothing there, right? Um, this is an early um, cabin in Indian territory. And um, I believe it is in the Creek Nation. Uh, I don't have my notes in front of me for, for this one, um, but I included that image. So another one of the archival images that I find to be kind of telling in terms of um, just what, what life was like in general, right? For, for all people who were um, living on the land during the time. Um, this is a, an Afro-Indigenous family, um, mixed race, quote unquote, um, uh, Indigenous and um, African-American. Um, we have the cowboys that I was talking about before, right? Um, on the left and then also the right. Um, and so you have these images that exist in photography, uh, but 
aside from contemporary artists, right? When I say contemporary, like, you know, late 20th century or throughout the 21st century, um, you have less, right, of, of this kind of imaging in, in um, painting. Another one of these, uh, you know, come one, come all, come to the, you know, come to the, the space. Um, this is the one I was talking about before about going to Kansas. So it was like, come to Kansas, come to Oklahoma, come to Nebraska, come to Texas, come everywhere. You know, in Texas, you had the freedom colonies um, that were already established, but then you have um, other companies and who had already purchased land and were then selling the land at, at a premium, trying to get people to come and, and settle the space. And I was saying, as I was saying before, there wasn't um, much conversation about what that meant, right? Um, it just, it was just come, right? Come and then make yourself anew. This is just a, an, another example of kind of who was moving where and when. Um, you have some examples of, You have some, and yeah, that's true, yes. <laughs> um, you have some examples of, of some of the towns that were started earlier on in um, Oklahoma and Kansas. That term exodusters? Very good question. So exodusters actually um, comes from, well, it comes from um, the movement of African-Americans from the South into Kansas. And so you have this grand exodus, right? Like the biblical exodus, but they're going into this dusty, <laughs> dusty space, right? Into, on the prairie, right? Um, and so then you have, so then you have kind of this colloquial name, the exodusters, right? Um, so it's a mixture between the exodus and then the, and then the dust. What, what, what is the, the, the legacy of the, towns that were established were, were they ultimately successful up to the present or so, what? so it depends on where you mean just all throughout the plains well, you're, you're focused on oklahoma and okay because i was going to say because i mean we have towns and move your slide back so we can see those towns. well in fact you know what i think i'll move it forward because um we have another map this one um, and so this particular map actually has in red all of those towns that still exist um, out of the original 50 some odd or however many it was in Oklahoma. Um, as you notice that uh, you have this dividing line here between what was Oklahoma territory and well, so all of it was in Indian territory, right? And then with the, um, again, renegotiation, quote unquote, of these treaties and the movement of the land and the reduction of the land from native tribes, you then have all of Oklahoma territory, which becomes federally owned and kind of open to the, the public, you're right, and to use that term. And so, but if you notice the, the towns that, the majority of the towns that still exist are over on the, the right side. So um, you they had the, the privilege of um, being closely aligned with sovereign nations, right? In terms of sovereign uh, Indian tribes. Um, a lot of the people who were living in these towns or founded these towns or were closely associated, right? Um, with the tribes in some way, if not directly related, you know, to, to people um, in the tribes. And you also have most of these um, are on, you know, various different uh, tribal res reservations, right? So, I mean, you have then kind of that support there. Um, now, there were towns in, in um, Texas. <laughs> there were towns in New Mexico. There were towns in, I mean, these kind of like all, all Black towns. You have towns in Nebraska, in Wyoming, um, in Colorado, right? So it wasn't just Oklahoma, but Oklahoma had the largest number. Um, now, for all of those other places that I mentioned, um, there are some signs, you know, historical markers that, have, that mark the space. Uh, like, for example, in Deerfield, Colorado, there's just one building that was there, you know, that, that still remains. It's kind of dilapidated, but it's been there since the 19th, since the early 20th century, I'm sorry. Um, and then you have other um, uh, kind of recovery projects for lack of a better way of putting it where people have kind of gone in and trying to figure out you know with with 
modern technology, virtual reality, right? You know, um, mapping drones, what have you, like where the town, you know, boundaries actually were. So I'm saying all to say that for most of those other towns, they just exist as kind of memories, right? You have descendants who are from those towns um, who talk about what it was like, you know, girl going to visit grandma or, or what have you there and what it was like maybe even growing up in those areas. And so that's one of the things that I've noticed with the project that um, I'm directing with the homesteading project is that we had a lot of a lot of these towns in Oklahoma territory started out as homesteading communities um, on the west side. Um, and so um, Langston, for example, um, and uh, Brooksville um, definitely were Langston, of course, still exists, but it has Langston University there. Um, but so you see a lot of these others, but there are also many others that are not on this particular map because at the time when this map was made, kind of the sheer number of these smaller communities wasn't maybe necessarily known. And so that's a lot of the work that we're doing is trying to figure out where they were uh, because they're, 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 it's kind of, they, they exist in the archives, they exist in the records, um, but these records, you know, are like one historical society has some one thing, right? This one over here has something else. This county has that, the National Archives has this. So everything is kind of all over the place in terms of trying to pull it together. Um, and a lot of descendants, have contacted me, um, and you know, since they found out about kind of the work that I was doing to try and put all this together, and said, you know, well, do you know about such and such place? Because that's where you know my my grandfather started a school there, and I'm like, wow, you know. Then we go and find, you know, so it's it's a really interesting project. Um, I know, I'm sorry, that was a long answer to your question, which I answered a long time ago, which was that there are 13 remaining still in Oklahoma, and then in these other spaces, um, they tend to be um, uh, marked by historical markers. These are, oh, so I included these because again, uh, thinking about this self image, right? How people are, are, are making themselves, right? And presenting themselves um, to the public. Um, so this is a very, very common pose, not just for African-American homesteaders or African-American farmers, but for all folks who were living on the plains, standing in front of your house, usually with an animal, uh, I mean, a, an, an actual, not, I don't mean like a dog, but the dogs are there, but usually the horses or the oxen or something, right? And everyone kind of lined up next to each other, right, facing out. Right. And so you have the image of the house. Right. Um, or maybe if you, it's even a sod house, which I'll get to in a minute. And then, you know, everyone's kind of dressed in their Sunday best and are looking forward. And this is the image of progress. Yes. Who's making these so it varies. Um, there are several, um, several photographers uh, from the time who's uh, that were their photos are in in the archives um in state in, in historical archives um and so you have you know local for they usually are local local photographers um who are taking these images but also you have those that are coming from the east coast um who are interested right in kind of what's happening in the west and they're traveling through and taking these photos so it varies yes you know why when Canada opened up, they chose to leave, say, Oklahoma. Well, Oklahoma specifically, because in 1907, Oklahoma became a state. The very first bill that Oklahoma signed, uh, uh, voted into law was a Jim Crow bill. Um, prior to 1907, it was not uh, utopia, but um, there were integrated schools, right? There were people who were working together and living, living, you know, in the same communities. Because um, every, you know, it was it was a new, newer territory in terms of the way we think about American, you know, American um, democracy. And so you had folks who were coming into the space all kind of, you know, from the same um circumstances okay um so these divisions weren't necessarily there of course you had those who were already there right the native uh folks who were already there and then um you know uh, people who are now known as black freedmen who were there um but i'm talking about for those who were moving into the space and so people were um interested in building community from the ground up right and they were fairly i mean I, i'm not again trying to make it seem like it was some you know kumbaya, but, but it was fairly, you know, integrated, right? Um, and then as more people started to come in uh, from areas where they were not um, accustomed to the kind of 
multicultural environment. And they were really looking at looking at this movement into Oklahoma territory as being a place where they can, you know, kind of create their own little sovereign, you know, recreation of the South or whatever it was. Um, then you started to have uh, this kind of shift in terms of attitude and rhetoric. I mean, two of the, the first um, territorial legislatures were African-American, right? Legislators rather were African-American in Oklahoma. I mean, you know, so they were involved in politics, all sorts of things. Um, but then, like I said, there was a shift um, toward a more con very, very kind of uh, conservative and kind of racist and anti-Black, right, move. And then by the time statehood, the question of statehood came about, um, the the argument was, and in, in, uh, 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 I've written about this, but an argument that was uh, very popular uh, was that, well, if we're going to take control, right, of this territory and make it into a state, it has to be, uh, we have to have our ticket, you know, or, or the, the, um, political ticket, it must be lily white, right? That was the terminology that was always used. Um, and so you start to see more of that. So then by 1907, when we have then the, the state, um, I'm sorry, the territory becomes a state. Um, the very first bill is, you know, a Jim Crow uh, bill in terms of segregation on railway cars. Then, then there was a, a school segregation uh, law. Then, you know, because like one after the other, one after the, uh, the other, and then it became a kind of a very hostile environment. And so, you have a lot of people who move out of Oklahoma, and these are primarily people who would, you know, move into Oklahoma. So they weren't, you know, born and raised there, um, and they go off looking for, you know, some other place where they could try and raise their children and, you know, make a community. Um, and so some people moved to um, uh, New Mexico. Some people moved, to, a lot of people moved to Texas, right? It's, of course, the close proximity. Um, a lot of people moved to Texas. People moved to um, Colorado. People moved to Nebraska. You know, people are moving back to Kansas because a lot of people came in from Kansas. And then when you had these advertisements for Canada, it was like, oh, you know, the Canada's always been friendly, right? It's always kind of like, you know, thinking about, you know, the, the Underground Railroad, right, from, from years before, right? Canada's always been a, a nice place. Um, and so then Canada then becomes that space um, until it wasn't. Um, so these other images, I, I have like one minute. So <laughs> these other images here again are just kind of showing the way. I love this one. This is the one that was on the, this is the one that was on the um, the announcement for this talk because the dog, the way the, the way that this family positions the dog, and this is in um, Nebraska. This is the Spies family. I um, I laugh every time I see this because they are very serious about this dog being a part of the picture, and to the point where the dog gets its own chair. And so, um, but anyway, as you see behind them, they have you know the traditional kind of sod um, house, right? Um, and they're out in uh, western Nebraska. Um, and this is just kind of another ad. Oh, this one has a caption and you can't see it, but it says, um, someone wrote on the picture mansion in Oklahoma. <laughs> and so this is kind of that, you know, dugout, right. That kind of traditional dugout, um, where they literally have, you know, dug the hole into the, to the soil and to the, to the earth. And then you have the, the door and the frame right out here. And so, and I like this picture. I use this one for the homesteading project uh, website because you have the, I, I'm assuming, you know, husband or what have you and children like over there and like the mom is standing there with, <laughs> with her arms akimbo, her arm akimbo with the door. Like, you know, yes, this is, you know, this is, Either she's saying this is, you know, our home or she's saying, I can't believe he brought me out here, <laughs> which we see a lot also with some of the Kansas homesteaders. Like, I mean, there are all these these um, uh, interviews with people, oral histories of people from, you know, the 19th century. And they're just like, I came from Memphis. It was a city. And I came out here and I saw little smokestacks out the ground. I'm like, what is this? I just burst into tears. You know, people were just like very upset. Um, because they're, you know, they've been told you're coming to this paradise. The ground is fertile. You know, you can you have crops for miles and miles and the sun never sets and all this. And they get out there and it's cold, harsh terrain. They can't farm the ground, you know, and it's like, well, what do we do now? And so you have um, that break between kind of reality and this image. Um, and the last thing I'll show you um, is just this is an original. Um, copy of the um, 
the kind of the, the final stamp right on the the homestead document right so this is what you would after you filled out all this paperwork after you, you were on the land for five years and you've done all of this you have your affidavits and the witnesses and all of this right you 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 have the testimonies that yes this person is an upstanding individual da, 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 right um you go through this entire process of filing your claim um and then you finally get this document which says the land is now yours right and it's as you see signed by theodore roosevelt um <laughs> down there at the bottom um so and there are um it's not often that we come across these actually um because they just don't, don't always end up in the the archives that we're we've been looking in so and this one actually is a single woman head of house well a woman head of household matilda branner I think it's interesting that it's a, oh. we always thought it was 160 acres, but it's 159 and 200. Well, it's supposed to be 160 acres. I'm not sure what happened with Matilda's little last bit there, um, but it definitely is supposed to be 160 acres. Um, that was the maximum. Um, and then some people, you know, they would, families would pool their resources and, you know, have double that. And then um, there were also allotments that were given to the um, formerly enslaved uh, people who were a member of the tribes, members of the tribes, right? And so they were um, allotted land within that kind of renegotiated land allotment. And so technically, I think they were supposed to get 160 as well, but it was really up to the tribal government. So sometimes people got 50, 80, you know, what have you. I mean, it depended on what they so what they want. Still going on in 1903, apparently. Yeah, so the Homestead Act officially doesn't end until the 1970s. Um, even though people weren't really, you know, <laughs> I know, I know, people weren't really, you know, taking advantage of it. But it really wasn't until the 1970, I can't remember the exact year, um, when it was officially, you know, kind of um, uh, closed or canceled as a as a as a uh, federal project. Yes. Um, but what you notice, especially on the plains, I mean, for very good reason, um, I'm sure you understand that around the 20s and 30s, right, with the drought and, the, you know, the depression and all of this, um, you have a lot of people who are moving out of these spaces. And so it fall, you kind of you, these these um, attempts to kind of claim land through the Homestead Act really fall off drastically after the 1920s. Um, and so, I mean, even though you still can, they, th they still could, right? And you have like one here and one there, but you don't see it in mass like you did between 1890, or sorry, 1862 for the larger plans, 1862 through about 1920. Well, thank you very much for listening. <laughs>